Thank you very much, Vice President, and thank you for, for inviting me to attend uh, this meeting. As you said last week, we already had a very fruitful uh, uh, gathering with uh, non-confessional organizations. Um, at the Commission, I hope you, you, will be, you will be there as well. We will have another meeting with confessional organizations later this year, I think in early November, 7th of November. Um, to me personally, but to the Commission as an institution, these meetings are of extreme importance. Um, sadly, over the last decade or so, um, in Europe, we've started to confuse uh, instruments and uh, goals. Uh, sometimes the internal market is portrayed as an instrument, as, as a goal per se. Sometimes the common currency is portrayed as a goal per se. These are nothing more than instruments to underpin the values we share as Europeans in a context of a long, long history of strife in Europe, of confrontation, of not talking to each other but fighting with each other, of not finding compromise but wanting to dominate. Last um, Friday, I was in, in, in Hessen, in, in Bad Hersfeld, where there was a uh, theater festival where uh, there was a theater piece on, on Martin Luther, um, celebrating, of course, 500 years of, of Reformation. And I, I, again, in, in, in watching the piece and, 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 and listening to what was said, I was reminded of the fact that a simple call for reform, for changing, if it is not understood as a true and honest call for reform and changing, can be seen as a frontal attack on the establishment and institutions, and can then lead to a, to a cascade of reactions which um, were not what Luther wanted, uh, but which happened anyway. And after his death, Europe had 100 years, 102 years to be precise, before we found a balance between the different interests. And so many years of bloody strife, of bloody religious wars that destroyed so many lives. So this is our common history. And we're now sitting uh, around the table with people who, in their collective memories, know the history of strife and confrontation in Europe. We have We've had this confrontation between Christians. Even worse, we've had centuries and centuries of anti-Semitism, of scapegoating Jews whenever there was something going on in our society which, people, which led to people uh, being afraid or uncertain about their future. We have the relatively new phenomenon of anti-Muslim hatred, which is now also increasing in many of our member states. My conclusion is this, whenever fear becomes a dominating factor in society and politics, becomes easy to manipulate it. Fear leads to anger, and anger leads to scapegoating others, and that leads to confrontation, and in European history, in the end, it leads to war. So if this European project is about anything, it's not about the common market, it's not about the euro, it's about helping Europeans never return to the past of confrontation and war. And I think sometimes we underestimate this fundamental principle of our European cooperation. With all the things we do wrong and need to be reformed, need to be changed, with all the improvements that our common project needs, improvements that will come about if you take full part in those dialogues, we need to stay in touch with the fundamental principle that this project is a project of peace first and foremost and that instruments are used to bring that peace about, uh, uh, under which are the common market and the common currency. I say this also at a time where we see across Europe that we feel extremely comfortable in the company of people who are like us, and that we seek dialogue with people with whom we already agree, and that we have lost the art of dialogue with those with whom we disagree. And the only way in a diverse society as ours we can come to, come to a common understanding of the values we share is that we do not avoid the confrontation with those with whom we don't agree. The only way you can find a compromise is to listen to people with whom you don't agree, not just to listen to people with whom you agree. And I think there has been a long experience now, especially also in religious organizations, of finding meeting places where you have space to disagree, 
space to disagree and then find common ground. I think this is the essence of how Europe is organized and how Europe functions at its best. And I think we have a collective responsibility to not avoid people with whom we disagree, even passionately. It is easy to talk about so-called populists and radicals, etc. But are we really interested in why people vote for these radical politicians, why people follow people with these ideas? If we only talk to them, we can find out why, and perhaps we might be surprised if we learn the real motives, and perhaps we might find common ground even if today we don't think that is possible. And I believe this dialogue is essentially, has as its ultimate goal to find common ground, to listen to each other. What distinguish, actually, Albert Camus said that the only thing that distinguishes us from animals is the capacity to look through somebody else's eyes. I think this is a capacity that is absolutely essential if we are to find ways out of our today's troubles. And I think we're all moral beings. Nobody has a monopoly on what is right, nor has everybody a anybody a monopoly on what is wrong. We all make mistakes. We all try and be moral people to the best of our ability. I'm deeply convinced of that. And we could all achieve that if we embrace dialogue as a way of moving this European project forward. For that and our common future, the European Commission has put on the table a white paper which is no longer the traditional paternalistic way of going about things and presenting a project um, fully fledged, uh, and then people could say yes, no, or please could you amend this or that. It is presenting a number of options, a number of directions in which Europe could be developed in the next years, years or generation even, and it's open for a dialogue with our member states. And within the member states, hopefully, governments will use this opportunity to have a dialogue with their citizens on which direction the European Union should take. This is the position of the Commission. It is essential that people who reflect on morality, if, if I can just find a common denominator for confessional and non-confessional uh, organization, it's this reflection about man and its place in society, and his place in society on a moral basis. If we don't reflect about the European Union, starting from a moral perspective, there's no point. And that's why I believe the dialogue we have in the framework of Article 17 is so important to the Commission and to all European uh, organizations. I have to apologize for leaving early today. I uh, need to go to another public e event uh, later today in, in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam. Um, and I'll be leaving very early tomorrow morning to go to, to Switzerland to discuss uh, uh, Cyprus. But I have to, again, offer my full cooperation with all of you to find common answers to what is one of the biggest challenges our generations have faced. In the fourth industrial revolution, the world is changing very quickly. The discussion about morality is more important than the discussion about the economy, I would say. Uh, and it is highly needed to find common ground in Europe with all of you. I want to thank the European Parliament for organizing uh, this uh, meeting. And I want again to pledge the Commission's full support for what the Parliament is doing this and especially for what Vice President McGuinness is doing in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you.